So hi, I'm really happy to uh, do this interview and to motivate people to come to your uh, keynote lecture at OFM 2019. So I read that you are studying the chemistry of the adaptive mind and um, a motivation and creative control. So at the end of the interview, I'd like to help people yeah. uh, see if they would need an adaptive mind to attend your lecture. Mm -hmm. And I would like to start with um, well, the basic. So imagine you are meeting um, a random person of the mm -hmm. street. Uh, how would you describe uh, your research? Mm -hmm. Well, first, thanks for giving me this opportunity. You're welcome. Yeah. What I would say? Well, I would say something like, um, imagine you had to listen to me give a lecture or an interview. Listen to this interview the next half hour right but you um, forgot to turn off your phone and it's constantly beeping and there's Facebook messages and there's tweets and there's metamost messages whatever <laughs> and so the sort of willpower that you need to continue to listen to this interview or to my lecture mm -hmm. um, the cognitive control that you need, that's that's what we study and we're really good at that. Mm -hmm. It's associated with a part of the brain that's really well developed, but we fail to exert control, to exert willpower all the time. Why is that? What limits human cognition? That's really the overarching sort of question of our research program. Well, maybe it's uh, really applied to the scientists and to the mind. Yeah. 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 Um, so, through your career, what do you consider to be your greatest achievement? Well, okay, greatest achievement. So, <laughs> <a> first question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, maybe I can just sort of follow up on what we we're just what I was just saying yeah. about what um, what our overarching question is, which is about. What, what makes us fail so often, not just if you have ADHD, but also, you know, our healthy adult brain fails to exert control all the time. And one reason for that, I believe, is that um, exerting control all the time is a bad thing. Um, so what our brain does is basically decide whether it's good or bad to exert control and then makes a decision. Uh, it, it, if you will, it regulates um, all kinds of computational trade-offs, including the trade-off between favor, working hard, you know, exerting mental effort, mental control, willpower, or letting go. Mm. And that is exactly what um, the large ascending neuromodulatory systems like dopamine, uh, but also noradrenaline, are important for. Um, and that is something that we're starting to uh, to show, to demonstrate in the lab. Um, and we do that with um, a combination of techniques, pharmacology, but also fMRI and chemical PET, where we measure these neuromodulators directly in the brain, so dopamine and PET in particular. Um, and yeah, I guess um, there's a few things that we've shown uh, that I could say I'd be proud of. Mm. Um, so what we do is we look at the effects of drugs that uh, that change these neuromodulators like dopamine and serotonin, so dopaminergic drugs. Uh, and what we've found is that these effects are extremely variable. Um, and the whole um, program so far has been focused on trying to elucidate the factors that um, that determine whether you will benefit or not from these uh, drugs, these so-called cognitive enhancing drugs. Uh, and what we find is that the effects of these drugs depend on the baseline state of the system. So if you have low levels of dopamine, you get better. But if you have high levels of dopamine, you get worse. Um, so the effects of these um, dopaminergic drugs, which are often used as smart pills, brain pills, like mm -hmm. Ritalin, yeah, for example, for ADHD, yeah. but also uh, in academia, actually, in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, their effects depend very much on 
their baseline state, baseline levels of dopamine. That's one thing. The other thing we found is that the effects depend on where in the brain it acts. So a lot of people are studying the neurophysiological signature of the cells that produce dopamine or noradrenaline mm -hmm. um, with electrophysiology, for example. But what we find is that the effect of these neuromodulators depends on where in the brain it acts. So in the prefrontal cortex, for example, dopamine has a very different effect from uh, the striatum compared with the striatum. Uh, so if we want to understand what a drug that acts on the system uh, does to human cognition, we have to take into account a number of factors. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of a long answer to your question. But no, but yeah. it's perfect. And I guess then <coughs> you are working the lab toward like understanding if also those baseline will have an interaction with uh, the drug. Like depending on the area and so on? Yes, exactly. So, um, just concretely, we are asking uh, fairly large groups of, uh, of subjects to come to the lab. Mm -hmm. We measure their baseline level of, uh, of dopamine with PET. And then we ask them to undergo an MRI scan mm -hmm. um, once after intake of a placebo pill and once after intake of, for example, the dopaminergic drug. The com most commonly used drug is methylphenidate, Ritalin, so we, we use that in the lab also. And we assess whether the effect of, in this particular case, Ritalin, depends on how much dopamine you have in your brain measured with PET. And we see that that is the case. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting because only it can, uh, can be applied to, uh, um, to the psyche quite easily. How do you imagine like, the translation of your mm. research? Yeah, um, so I think the first implication, larger implication of the work is, is still a pretty fundamental one. It's like a, a better understanding of, um, of the mechanisms, neurochemical mechanisms of motivational and conflict control. Mm. Uh, and then ultimately also a better understanding of how we might maximally exploit mental capital, our mental, human mental capital. And that has possibly uh, in the longer run some implications for education. Um, I guess that would be the first domain. How do we promote cognitive control? How do we promote um, also creativity? You know, mm -hmm. where this balance between focus and flexibility is also very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the second domain is, is the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so most concretely, we're working on building a, a proxy model of dopamine synthesis capacity consisting mm -hmm. of behavioral predictors mostly, but also physiological predictors like spontaneous eye blink rate perhaps, mm -hmm. and see how we can optimally combine all these predictors to provide a pragmatic, a practical tool that can be used to predict how someone will respond to a dopaminergic drug. Um, yeah, because so far there's been a whole lot of studies, uh, including some of my own, suggesting that, for example, dopamine synthesis capacity is correlated with working memory capacity. And indeed, we see that dopaminergic mm -hmm. drug effects depend on working memory capacity. And of course, working memory capacity is much easier to measure in the lab yes. or in the clinic than, than the PET scan to measure dopamine synthesis mm -hmm. capacity. Um, so if we can establish that these proxy measures of dopamine are equally good predictors of mm -hmm. drug effects, and that gives a, a pragmatic handle on tailoring drugs treatments to the individual. Um, so that's a, a, a second promise, but I think we have to um, accept that this is not something that will be kind of in use within the next five years or so. But for sure, yeah. I think it's, like, it's really interesting that uh, your research is also multimodal mm -hmm. and that uh, you need to integrate PET FMRI to, to be able to study that, uh, that question in a special and to apply to, <coughs> to drugs. Um, so I guess also what you are going to present in your uh, keynote lecture mm -hmm. and um, uh, doing the or do you have like 
uh, extra thing that you want to talk about? Or? Yeah. No, I think I will um, make this point that um, I think the general point that I will make is that the, the human brain faces a number of these computational trade-offs, mm -hmm. uh, like the trade-off between flexibility and stability, between labor and leisure. Mm -hmm. um, and we need a way, an ability, mm -hmm. to dynamically regulate this trade-off, depending on changes, the constantly changing task em environment. Mm -hmm. And I'll make the point that the ascending, the large ascending neuromodulators mm -hmm. like dopamine um, are really perfectly suited to dynamically regulate these trade-offs. And I'll illustrate that by highlighting a number of general principles uh, of chemical neuromodulation, like mm -hmm. this baseline dependency principle. Mm -hmm. uh, I might refer, I'm not sure yet, <laughs> but to the motivational opponency principle. Huh? That's another mm -hmm. kind of observation. The general point is I will yeah, talk about these multimodal mm. projects that we're doing in which we combine pets and pharmacology and yeah, MRI yeah. to work towards a better prediction model of dopamine receptor perfect. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, now in, in general, um, I would like the community of OHVM is promoting um, open science. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> they are creating like a, a number of different uh, special interest groups to um, uh, talk about like trend in science such as open science or equality or diversity. Uh, those those topics really apply to your daily life and how mm. uh, what you promote in your lab. Mm. Yeah, um, we are certainly quite active. Um, in in those areas, I mean, I guess the diversity issue it comes relatively natural mm -hmm. if we talk about gender diversity, at least. Simply by being me, I, I must admit that I don't, I'm not very active um, apart from just being me. And I notice that um, just by being me, I attract other women mm -hmm. in science. So I think I fulfill a role there. Uh, we talk it's about it, yeah. Um, for open science, reproducible science, um, yes, like many other labs, we've also taken a number of um, steps, uh, defined operating procedure procedures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when new people arrive in the lab, we highlight those to them, and those include that all studies we do are pre-registered now uh, on OSF. And open science framework. Um, yeah, we're trying to promote version control, so we have um, a lab Git account. Mm -hmm. um, we try and you know explicitly uh, check each other's code for analyses. I um, as it's not the uh, the funnest thing for everyone, but for most projects now, I ask another lab member to rerun the analysis of another mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. um, because they're so error prone and we mm -hmm. want to make sure that they're reproducible. Um, we promote the use of interactive notebooking, for example. And I must admit that a lot of this was uh, influenced very much by one of my postdocs, uh, Bram Zandveld, who's mm -hmm. very active in this yeah. uh, field and I was influenced by him. He had a great influence on us as a lab. So. Yeah acknowledge that and he's also teaching in our local donors reproducibility course so yeah that's really helpful yeah yeah that's interesting because i was uh, going to ask about your monitoring uh, system yeah. how do you promote that apparently you have like a back and forth learning yeah. in your team oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah no i can't do this all by myself but yeah <laughs> so well if you have like a new researcher arriving in your lab what would you advise them mm. to do for their career? Ah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, we need one or two points. I mean, there's yeah, so yeah there's so <laughs> much. But, um, right. So I think the most important thing for scientists, but also for 
actually anyone, mm -hmm. is to um, constantly ask yourself uh, which things uh, you can control and which you cannot control, mm -hmm. and then accept the things you can't control, but act on the things that you can control. Now, for a new researcher, a new person entering the field, the things that they can control um, are selection of a mentor, and I think that's um, uh, very important. By the way, these uh, these um, I'm following the advice here from uh, um, Jay McLellan. Mm -hmm. um, I just listened to a wonderful interview uh, on the Brain Inspired podcast by Paul Leopold. And I thought that was wonderful advice. Um, and it was find the right mentor who you can bounce ideas off. Mm. Um, but the other point um, is that it's the key is, I think, to find a project that's uh, to define a project for yourself that you find is representative of a general, a larger question, but is still tractable. Mm. Um, I think those two, two points are very important. But the starting point is the first one that I said is constantly ask yourself what are the things that you can control and what are the things that you can't control. Yes. Because I notice many people spend quite a lot of time and energy on things that are outside of their control. Um, and that's you know, a missed opportunity in a sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much for your time and uh, I'm really now looking forward for your lecture and learn more about the cognitive control and dopamine system. Thanks, so. it was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed it.